evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Paint Desk Ramblings. Uh, so tonight I am joined by not one but two guests. Uh, first, we have uh, uh, from the Thundercogs podcast, the uh, number one UK podcast that they know of. <laughs> Uh, we have Jordan. Say hi. Hello, folks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, happy to have you here. Uh, we also have uh, uh, one of the a very, a very well known figure of the Ninth Age. Uh, he's the, the head of rules team. It's uh, Fugin. Hello. Or Eric, as we just discussed, that I should re refer you to. Uh, I do it fine. Uh, so, the topic for tonight is hosting tournaments. Uh, so I think we'll begin with a short, yeah, we'll, we'll talk to, uh, through the process of ho hosting tournaments, basically. So uh, we'll begin with a short rundown of our own experiences with hosting tournaments. Uh, so I can, I can begin. I've hosted something like uh, a dozen, 15 maybe, tournaments total, co-hosted um, here in, in Stockholm called the Necronomic Quest. It's uh, almost uh, consistently uh, twice a year. Uh, so that's <laughs> that's my experience. What about you? Uh, let's start with uh, Jordan. Um, so I've recently finished my third uh, singles event, um, Black Country Brawl in the West Midlands in the UK. Um, I had never run a tournament before, um, and I imagine we'll get into it, but first time was the most nerve-wracking thing I'd, I'd ever done. Um, but it's it's great, it's really fun, and just seeing like 40 people, your friends because of communities like that, um, just enjoying themselves and thanking you for running a good weekend is probably the coolest thing I get out of it. Yeah, uh, that's uh, really one of the best parts of running tournaments, seeing all the all the happy faces. Yeah, definitely. For sure. So you, Eric? All right. Um, I've been hosting maybe uh, somewhere below 10 tournaments. I took over from a pretty well-established tournament in the middle of Sweden called... Um, Quest for Atlantis, which was run for like 10 years before my time. I played it for most of those 10 years. Uh, the head organizer sort of quit the hobby. I took over and I've been running that tournament for six years, maybe a bit more. Uh, and then I've hosted a couple of like small one day events here in Uppsala as well. Yeah. Uh, so, then we have some some small established uh, understanding of what we we are we we know some of what we're talking about at least we have have some experience. Well, we can fake it till we make it. That's <laughs> my that. thing. Yeah. So, but before we get into the meat of the episode, we have some other stuff to go through. Uh, unfortunately, we are having some technical difficulties, so we'll see how well. The video turns out um, in the end, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll see basically. Uh, let me check here. Yeah, so uh, the uh, the hobby spotlight basically. So um, why don't you go first, Eric? What are you working on? Uh, so currently, I'm painting a wizard model. I'm not quite sure what it is. It's, uh, or I can check if it's important. It's some kind of uh, War Machine Hordes model from the um, Privateer Press. Thing. Yeah, Privateer Press. Uh, what's what's it? Why? Well, um, yeah, I don't think you can see it very well in that camera. No. <laughs> it doesn't focus. No, yeah. Uh, but it, it, it's a wizard for my Sylvan Elves, uh, taken from the Privateer Press Hordes range. I don't remember the exact name of the model. Uh, do you want me to check? 
Yeah, you can you can check that up later and, and send me the link, and I I'll uh, edit in uh, a, a link to it in the des- description. All right. Yeah. If you want. Uh, so yeah, that's neat. Uh, I painted a few um, warmer hordes models myself, not that many, uh, but they are w- very nice sculpts, I think. So mm, yeah, good quality. Yeah, they're cool. They're very cool. They they know what they're doing. Yeah. So what about you, Jordan? Um, I'm just working on some Vampire Covenant. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen. Um, have you seen that Mortal Realms magazine? Uh, for Age of Sigma, what's just been released? I've um, seen about it, but I have uh, ah, not. So uh, um, you get 25 chain rasps and some Stormcast Eternals, but I'm going to use um, the chain rasps in a Vampire Kent's Covenant army. Um, and you get uh, 10 models for £2.99. So, and they're all the Games Workshop plastic, so high quality. So I've brought eight copies of that and i think it works at about three euros a copy um whereas to get these models from games workshop or a, or a um, independent retailer um they're about 22 pounds for 10 or about 25 euros for 10 so yeah working on some of those that sounds like a bargain yeah so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool to hear uh, if all, all, all goes as, as planned, I will have edited in some pictures of those uh, as we are speaking. So for myself, and uh, again, we have some technical difficulties, so we'll see how it goes in the end. But I'm working on some uh, some crew members for a, uh, a pair of orc chariots. So they are the, the Games Workshop uh, orc war chariot models uh, converted slightly to make them. To, to not have co- have carbon copies of uh, of each set, so I've thrown in some some 40k orc bits and uh, cool. other, a few other things. So I had planned to uh, I had ordered a, an airbrush actually. Yeah. It was supposed to be delivered on Thursday, but uh, some issues, uh, oh, so nice. I won't probably get it on Monday now. But I, I, I had hoped to spend the week weekend experimenting with that, but. Uh, I had these red just to spray up, and I wasn't planning to use any airbrushing on them at least. So, do you um, airbrush normally, Matt? I have never tried it. Oh, it's so, so good! It's it's the future. Yeah, it's I, so good. I'm a bit ashamed of not having tried it. I, it's it's really really silly silly that I haven't gotten into it before now. It's so good. It's look fun. For, looking forward to that. So. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's what I have to say about my little, little project here. So on to some news then. And I thought I'd start with some miniature news. I uh, Not a lot this recent time. Um, I think the one thing that I do have is a, an, a new ogre model from uh, um, what they're called Never Realms. Um, so let's see if I can share my screen at least. Uh, no, I don't seem to be able to even, no, there, there we are. Share screen. So now you should be able to see the Anogur. Ooh. Ooh. That's really <clears throat> cool. Yeah, I uh, was re- really happy to see, to see this this fella it's uh, it's it's a neat little sculpt i think lots of character um if i ever were to do an ogre army might or probably would include this one might even get it anyway uh, use it as something in my yeah, it looks uh, a really nice sculpt uh, empire army so yeah i i thought that was neat D- don't know exactly when this was released but it's still listed as new on the site so that was acceptable for me yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much all the munition news I have. Do you have anything you want to highlight? Um, I'm just uh, quite excited. Um, I am a Games Workshop fanboy. I do some um, other game systems miniatures, um, but purely Games Workshop just because I like the quality of the models 
and the plastics and how they go together. Um, for their game Warcry, they've just put up some pictures of what can only be described as a demonic cat. Um, the spy, spy rinks, or something like that. Um, so I don't know what I'm going to use it for, but I'm going to use it. It looks like it'll fit on a chariot base, um, so quite sizable. Um, so if I want to do something for Warriors of Dark Gods, Demonic Legions, but also maybe for Undying Dynasties as a Sphinx, as like a living yeah. Sphinx, because it's got lots of jewellery on it. Um, so yeah, that, that should be quite cool. And I'll um, I'll follow you a picture of that um, in a bit, just if people want to see it. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'll stop sharing if I can figure out how. <laughs> Uh, stop sharing. So if you you can share screen if you want. Oh, uh, so we do, do that. that. It's okay. I'm just uh, on my phone, so I'm just trying to. Uh... Oh, <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I, I think I've seen that model uh, from mm. the, some teasers <clears throat> a good while back, and it, it looked really neat. Yeah, it's uh, it should be good. So I'm looking forward to using it. Don't know what for. But I'll use it. Yeah. As a little side note, then I can uh, suggest that uh, Henry P. Miller recently started a thread on the forums uh, about community engagement with the Nine Scroll, mm -hmm. and he's asking people to make suggestions for cool miniatures that don't have rules, and uh, suggest some rules for them, basically. Ooh. So. You can go ahead and do that for the the Surinx or whatever it was called. Yeah, the uh, the sparkly kitty cat. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll have a chat with him. So, uh, yeah. Um, then I think we'll move on to uh, the big piece of new recent news, which is the the, the ninth scroll that was released uh, in early January. So. Uh, have you flicked through it, Danny? Yep. Do you want to take some highlights, uh, Eric? Um, well, I have one article which I found particularly interesting, which is the... There was an article about the uh, Raging Heroes, some kind of harpy models. Yeah. Yeah, harpies, yeah. Because uh, I... I found it interesting because I have been looking at these Raging Hero elves quite a lot. Uh, really nice models. I want to have them. I don't know what to use them for exactly, but <laughs> neat models. Uh, so it's uh, interesting to read about the quality of the models, um, which seems promising. He, he has pretty much only positive things to say about it. Yeah. Yeah, I read that too, and I agree. It was a good article, and um, nice to hear about those those models. I've um, actually tried the models or bought them. Yeah. Uh, don't think I I have any raging hero heroes models. Some of my friends do, but okay. And they have nothing bad to say. Do you know? Is it I, I don't. I don't think I've heard anything negative from people who brought in the UK either. Um, just seems to be good quality. And like you, Eric, I keep looking at them going, I don't know what I want to use them for, but I want them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of those kind of models. Which is a good sign for a model company. <laughs> I think the only only criticism I've heard of them is that they're too too detailed, <laughs> uh, which it also uh, this article mentioned that they have a lot of detail, especially for a, a unit of harpies. Yeah. It's like mm. not a lot of points and you have to go in front of things. Uh, but I also heard that the, in general they have very delicate sculpts and uh, can perhaps be a bit fragile because of that. Okay. But uh, generally they have some really awesome sculpts. So. I suppose there's got to be a trade-off between amazing models, amazing sculpts, and a little bit of delicacy yeah. in the models and how they're designed. But, yeah, they look really good. Really good. 
indeed. <clears throat> so, uh, do you have uh, any highlight, uh, Jordan? Um, I am the biggest Infernal Dwarf fanboy in the world. Um, I played them since I started playing Ninth Age back in 0.99. Um, and I finally put them down last year um, just to start something new. So seeing Tyranno's uh, conversions and bits and pieces on his Infernal Dwarf army was really cool. Um, I'm a big fan of his modelling. Um, so, yeah, just quite nice to see conver- like a conversion corner, I suppose, on the ninth scroll. Um, and it's always nice to see what people are working on and in the nicest way, taking ideas off them. <laughs> trying to improve your own hobby your own models um yeah really nice um big fan of joe or tyranno as he's known on the uh forum stuff so yeah it was really nice to see as an infernal dwarf player do, do you know him personally um i've met joe a few times um at tournaments he started going to tournaments in the uk um yeah he's infernal dwarfs in the flesh are the craziest coolest things i've ever seen um yeah so yeah, really nice, really nice. That's cool to cool to hear. Uh, uh, it was a, a neat article. Article, I, I agree. Also, some some hidden uh, spoilers for the the coming release. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that surprised me. I might need to buy some uh, chariot bases. Yeah. For the the Kadim chariot. <laughs> yeah. That sounds really cool. interesting, in my opinion. That's gonna uh, be cool. So. I guess Eric knows all about that, but uh, I, I won't ask him to, to reveal anything more. I'm sure he's uh, <laughs> yeah. under strict rules to <laughs> not reveal. Yeah, travel otherwise. <laughs> uh, so, for myself, some some highlights. Or, or were, were you finished, Jordan? Uh, no, 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 no. That, that, that was it. That was uh, always nice to see some uh, Infernal Dwarf goodness out and yeah. about. Uh, so, it, it was quite quite a a long art, uh, uh, scroll. This one, I think. So they ha- had a, really a lot of content. Uh, for me, it's uh, the, the background, the fluff is always some of the most imp- interesting parts of of each scroll. And this one had another of installment of the uh, Q and A session with uh, had a, had a Selig the great sage of Avras. So he answers some 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 more questions this time about um, about elven culture and longevity a bit and uh, the existence of, of half breeds, which he basically says uh, no, there are no such things. Uh, <coughs> and uh, yeah, quite a lot of neat. Quite a few questions, but very elaborate answers, I'd say. So there was one one about the uh, dwarves and their culture, if they are uh, patriar- <coughs> patriarchy or uh, if there are queens, basically, dwarven queens. And uh, they seem to be quite open-minded, those stunties. <laughs> so I thought that that was neat. Um, I think, yeah, um, that's uh, that's the hi- re- real highlight for me. Um, also mentioned the uh, tactics article by by Dan Thomas. Um, pretty basic, down to the roots uh, about uh, units and and what you how, what to think about when you're uh, adding units to your army basically what uh, what is the purpose and all, and all of that that was a list building uh, yeah right. he's uh he's pretty good isn't he Dan? <laughs> yeah i i've heard stories from many many a, a podcast <laughs> yeah he's a he's a good guy he's a good guy i'll uh, i'll have to read for, reread through that because i need all the help i can get at the moment <laughs> Uh, okay, so <clears throat> I think uh, I have two more small pieces of news that I want to mention. Uh, Last Sword Miniatures, they released a little uh, video of their casting process of their uh, their Saurian Ancients models, uh, which is yeah, very short. 
and uh, yeah, quite quite neat to see, I think. It's a very quick pro process, just putting the <clears throat> the molds in the machine, and out comes the models. So uh, I thought that was was neat to see. I'll include a link down in the description below. <clears throat> and also, I like to mention that the painting league for 2020 has started uh, on the Ninth Age forums. Quite a lot of signups already, I think. Uh, I think I might sign up for the first time this year. Yes, yeah, same here. I have um, I have a lot of blogs on the forums, so I felt it a bit unnecessary. But I realized that I have I started to have quite a lot of projects that don't really fall into any of my many any of my many blogs. So it could be good to have just a general place where I can throw in everything. <laughs> so do do you any of you guys have any more news that you want to share? Um, not from my end. Um, it links into this really about running tournaments, but the you know well the UK. Uh, Masters is next week, which is pretty cool. So I suppose that's happening. Um, be interesting to see how that runs because you've got the Masters itself, the top 16 players, and then you've got the side event, which is open up to other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that should yeah. be pretty cool. So that's coming up, yeah. Wait, wait as well. Mm. With a, a closed Master with like top. I don't know how many, top 10-ish, and then yeah. an event for, the, for everyone else. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the best of the rest, I think. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a polite way. Polite way. I, it? Yeah. Unfortunately, I missed that, that event this year. Uh, but uh, hope there's always next year. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's neat. Okay, so what do you say? We dive into the main segment. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hosting tournaments. So <clears throat> the angle I thought of for this was basically to to go through the process of uh, hosting a tournament from from planning to uh, a award show, basically. So um, first on that list for me at least, is uh, the venue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, very, very important <laughs> part of the any tournament, of course. Uh, so I think it varies quite a lot from country to country and even region to region, what's available for you to host in. But I thought we could talk a little bit <clears throat> about general things to, to keep in mind when, when choosing a venue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, price, obviously, it's one of the main things. <laughs> yeah. There are very nice venues if you like book a hotel or something like that, but then it's gonna be a way too costly. Yeah. Uh, lo location is a big thing as well. Um, where it's located within the country. Um, if it's got easy transport links, so if there's any airports, uh, train stations, um, Ubers, buses, anything like that, um, and just ease of it to get to. So if it's far, far out into the countryside, is that as good as something a little bit more expensive, but close to a city centre? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if you have something as simple as people want to eat. And if you're way out in the forest, then there's nothing to eat. Yeah. Yeah, I host one of those yeah. tournaments. A bit out, yeah, every, before, every year. 45 minutes to get to a good place. Doesn't really work. <clears throat> yeah. So one of the most common in Sweden, at least, places to host tournaments is uh, school buildings. Uh, usually you can get pretty good price. <clears throat> on those, um, is that common in in England too? Um, what's become more and more common um, in recent years is there's been a lot of um, independent gaming stores open um, up and down the UK. Um, 
the one local to me i can walk it from my house in about 20 minutes which is quite nice <laughs> nice um that has uh, enough tables for 40 people um and the good thing is um and i don't know what it's like in europe but the the parking is free there's a big free car park next to it um so gamers can rock up park it's locked overnight so the cars are safe um and you don't have to pay to use a car park um so they're happy they can get a, a taxi or an uber to a hotel pub restaurant um and they don't have to drive which is quite nice mm-hmm. what do you what do you pay for that is it expensive um so it's it's not too bad um for what they do they charge um a day rate uh for the people so it works out i think about seven euros per day okay um which is the av- uk average um some venues they've got their own sort of um i don't know what you call it not restaurant but they can they supply their own food like they've got a little kitchen in um at my events um i I do i would say it's me but it's not my wife does all the food um which is quite nice of her um so last event i think we had three vegetarians and two vegans and she luckily she's a chef so she just provided some quite nice alternative um vegan and vegetarian food it was nice actually i was surprised (laughs) not at the cooking (laughs) but at the uh, vegan uh, vegan cuisine that sounds really nice yeah so if you can get a cook to to do the food that's a big plus we can (laughs) it's not bad it's not bad yeah (laughs) I think in in Sweden we have quite a few uh, gaming clubs or stores that have really have the the, the space to host tournaments in. Mm-hmm. Maybe are. some of them have uh, can have smaller tournaments like uh, 20 people, something like that. Yeah. But no, <clears throat> no real large ones. I was going to say we have um in in the UK we have Element Games which can hold I think it's about 100 players. Um, Firestorm can also hold the same that's in Cardiff in Wales um, so we are quite lucky uh, the UK for for big events in like a gaming centre so that's uh, that's a bonus I suppose yeah. what do you think of it event in the UK oh sorry save it again what do you consider a big event um at the moment uh 50 plus okay yeah average is between uh, say average is 40 at the moment mm. that's roughly what we have over here as well yeah the, the the big ones pull in more people um i know mikey newman he's running a tournament um in the middle of next year and there's people um from different etc teams flying over which is really cool uh, for a singles event so that should be 60 70 plus okay yeah nice. which is quite exciting there, there is a plus with planning on going there oh, amazing it's uh yeah it should be very good um mikey always runs a good one and it's an element games so it's very nice yeah that sounds good um so, <clears throat> um, about schools, I think I, I'd like to, to mention one of the problems that I've run into, uh, which is the local government, basically. Uh, sometimes it's uh, the schools are owned by the local government. Governments have to go through them, them to, to rent it. Yeah, we're, we're that, using that. We're going to private schools only now. <laughs> yeah, it's, wow. it's a bit of a hassle. Um, we don't have that many options in the area, so we still still use the, <laughs> the their systems. And uh, <laughs> it's it, that's not really the issue, not, not their system. It's the lack of system. Every year it's a new process. <laughs> I actually re- recently started talking to them about ne- the next tournament and... Uh, 
Yeah, we'll see if anything happens. It's uh, going slow this time. So uh, keep in mind that if, if that's the case, uh, contact them well in advance, basically. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, I had one little more thing about the venue on my list here. We talked about food and, and parkings and commute and all of that, but uh, uh, sleeping arrangements. Yeah. Um, That's I know some, some people appreciate if the tournament uh, has, has that available for, for the participants. Um, I guess it's a bit harder in a, in a game store <laughs> to have people <laughs> sleeping there, uh, but in schools it's usually not, not a big issue. Yeah, I, I can see. As, I imagine there's lots of different side rooms people can crash in and mm -hmm. sleep, and it's not too bad. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's really uh, something good to to be able to offer at least uh, um, if you want to try try and get um, uh, some new blood, uh, some younger people into into the scene. Yeah, definitely. If they can't can't afford uh, to to stay in a hotel all the time. So that's something to, to keep in mind, uh, I think. I think most Swedish tournaments uh, offer this at least. Um, not all of them, but quite a lot. Quite a lot. And I, I usually uh, take adva advantage of it. Of it. In, in the UK, I, I, I think it's quite rare just because there's so many um, cheap hotels in, in a short in a small area so you, you could stay at a hotel um that costs 200 euros a night or you could stay in a hotel that costs 10 euros a night mm. so it's it's not too bad on your finances um but yeah i i think it's very rare to find one that does sleep on site in the uk okay i'm just indifferent Okay, so, oops, sorry about that. Um, my next point is uh, outreach. So, um, how do you how do you attract players to your tournament? Uh, where do you ad advertise it? And I think the the simple answer is the Ninth Age forums. So. Yeah, um, that's the obvious answer. <laughs> yeah, um, but. No, various Facebook groups is quite common um, for like, players to like, arrange meetings on Facebook, usually in like small groups or on, on um, their gaming groups or whatever. Uh, and these are often visited by people who aren't so much on the forums, so they can be quite successful. Just talk to people who like moderates such Facebook groups, they can spread the word. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, maybe I should get Facebook. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's for <laughs> local um, gaming groups. It's quite good because uh, they often have like the non-tournament going crowd. Um, and they might be open to come to like local tournaments at least. Yeah. The, the, the first step for people to get into the, the tournament. Yeah, it's, um, I bother people um, until they tell me to go away. If they're coming to my event or not, <laughs> a, a tournament whilst I'm there. Um, I don't know about different uh, countries, but um, a, a large percentage of the UK ninth age uh, community has got a WhatsApp group, um, so we share tournament information, um, ninth age chats, and everything in between um, on there. So uh, we use that the forum. I use Twitter and Facebook a lot because there's some people who might be out there and it's just trying to spread your net wide to make sure you catch everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, so social media is definitely great. Forum's good, um, but I think it's got to be used at, definitely at the moment with Facebook because there seems to be a lot of ninth age groups on Facebook. 
Um, and it's just getting the information to those people who may not even know there's a tournament half an, um, half an hour drive down the road from them. Yeah. Uh, that's good feedback. And uh, you, I think you started off by saying uh, to, to bother people at uh, tournaments about it, and that's certainly a way to... Yeah, at the, um, uh, during the awards ceremony, um, prize giving, which we'll get on to, I imagine, um, at the end, uh, those people who are about to run a tournament um, can just mention it in front of everyone. Uh, yep. Yep. Just at the end of the awards, which is pretty cool. Um, so upcoming event, this is where it's at. Give a brief overview. Everyone knows everyone in the UK ninth page scene. Um, so you can just so you can just say, oh, just drop me a message, find me on the forum, whatever's easiest. Um, so that's another good way, actually, in person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've actually been seeing people who bring like flyers to these. Yeah, class. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's quite handy. Definitely. Yeah, you get everything in right there. Yeah. Really good idea. Uh, I uh, actually I, I don't think I've ever really done that. I think um, maybe once or twice we asked the the, the, the TOs to to mention our, our tournament. But now that you mentioned it, I think it's, it can be really important actually because yeah. I'm, I'm starting to see quite a lot of new new people at uh, tournaments in Sweden. Mm-hmm. And those might not know of uh, all the other tournaments. They they go to the local one, ones perhaps. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a good way to. Yeah, to expand it, it. it takes 20 seconds after an event before everyone goes, so it's fresh in people's minds and they can talk about it on the way home. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's uh, that's a great, great little hot tip. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, keeping this moving, do we think that we are about done at Outreach? Yeah, um, in person, social media, on the forum, yeah. Sounds good. Uh, so next, I have format. So there are a lot of different ways to to uh, host a, ter- a tournament, uh, or a lot of different kinds of tournaments, I should say. So the biggest split, I think, is between team tournaments and singles tournament. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, just a, a short summary of what that that means. Team tournaments is when you have a team of uh, eight players at the ETC at least, but um, smaller tournaments usually have smaller teams, so four or five maybe. Um, and then each team gets paired against another, another team, and they themselves, uh, in a sort of mini game, uh, determine who, who plays whom at each table. And then you add up the score and the team. Um, to, to the team and then you pair, pair again. You have, you have to make this very clear because it's quite a common misconception. If you have five people on the team, you play five separate games. Yes. It's not like one big game with five players on, each, on the table. That I would like to see one uh, turn <laughs> do though. Yeah. That would be awesome. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's uh, the, the short quick gist of a team tournament and a singles tournament is uh, well the the standard tournament basically I would say yeah Um, so that's the that's the normal tournament so I think should we start with some some advice on hosting team tournaments perhaps Mm. Uh, before we do do that maybe we could just mention that there is no there's no right or no wrong way to do this. Everything is is allowed. Like you can, you can host the tournament however you like. You can do team tournament. You can do singles. You can do five against five on the same table if you. you I mean, if you can run doubles events as well. Um, yeah. I, I I recently finished my tournament where I actually ran it at three and a half thousand points um, mm-hmm. instead of four and a half. So ha- have a play around with points point levels as well because it throws up a different meta different lists um different styles of play um so have some fun with it think outside the box it doesn't always have to be 4500 
I, I think the, the only the only wrong way to do it is if you don't get any players. But then yeah. You can adjust yeah. and do it through something else. If you... Yeah, that's always the, uh, the worry. <laughs> they are the judge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, maybe we'll, we'll start with the, the singles tournament and go through them with some, some, some depth about what you can can play with. So you mentioned uh, point sizes. Yeah. Um, Bo- so, oh, sorry, go for it, dude. Yeah, uh, but both the smaller and and the larger can be interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, I wanted to originally my plan was to run uh, three games at three and a half thousand points, and then the two final games at four thousand five hundred, oh. um, and have a play around with it. I decided against it um, in the end to go for a sh- smaller game format, and instead of the well in the UK at least it's five games for a tournament. Yeah, uh, three on the Saturday, two on the Sunday. This one I actually did four games on the Saturday and two on the Sunday, so I actually had six games over the weekend. Um, so it was endurance hammer um, <laughs> on that ga- on that game four on the Saturday about five o'clock. People were getting uh, a little bit tired and wanted some food and uh, maybe a few okay. beers. <laughs> Uh, uh, six, six, six games. games. That's, that's a lot. Yeah, it was it was good. Uh, hindsight's a brilliant thing. Um, just because instead of three and a half, I'd have maybe taken the points level down to two and a half or even three. Um, just with uh, timings um, and the players not wanting their bed so soon after game four. But it's good. It, it's it's all a learning process, I think. Yeah. Yeah, you shouldn't be afraid to to try out something new. I I really wish that there were more tournaments in Sweden that ran smaller point costs and exper- experimented with that. It was One um, other... it was very very interesting. Some of the lists. Um, yeah. And it was good for people uh, practicing for the ETC and worried. A normal, I, I use speech bubbles. A normal event might might not be the right place to do it. Um, so you had units you wouldn't normally see on the table, especially in the UK. Yeah. So that was a positive, I think. I think another p- positive with the small point scale is that it's um, it's easier to come up with a new army. Yeah, uh, for, definitely. For, for beginners to the hobby and and to to veterans who want to start a new army. Yeah, it's it's not as scary. I know it's only a thousand points difference, but um, that that could come down to not having to either paint, build, or or even buy because some people have to work on a tight budget. Um, yep. And a thousand points could be a lot of money to some people. Um, so, like you said, it's just an easier entrance to the the tournament scene. I suppose is probably the best way to put it. Yep. Yeah, doubles are quite good for that as well. Like if you have two and a half thousand per mm. player, and then you play two and two, it's pretty much the same thing in terms yeah, of yeah, yeah. investment for new players. I mean, yes. also has the, 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 the added layer of you have a friend who maybe knows the rules, and if that's you cool. that's really helpful. Yep. Just so you've got that support. Mm-hmm. Um. Yes, I have to mention it, and I, I did an episode not that long ago about uh, about going to tournaments rather than hosting them, uh, together with uh, an American, uh, Grim, Grimbold Blackhammer of the forums. Mm-hmm. And we, we chatted uh, quite a lot, uh, rambling on, as ones do. <laughs> but <clears throat> one thing that was brought up was this uh, doubles tournament or, or tag team tournaments. And apparently, it's quite common in the U.S. to have tournaments where you uh, you rock up to the, to the tournament with a, a small army, two thousand points, something like that, and then you you are assigned a partner in each game. Mm-hmm. That's cool. That you have to team up with. So again, so you don't know beforehand. Uh, yeah, and you can't plan, build your list after after it and all of that. 
that's I, I, I've never been to, been to the such chaos. Tournaments, the but chaos it, that it would cause. sounds crazy, really fun, but a very different beast than the than the doubles tournament where you where you know who you're pairing up with. Uh, I think in in the UK, I don't know what it's like in your in your countries. Um, team tournaments aren't ranked. Um, for the end of year masters or or just standings, so yep. we don't actually have that many team tournaments in the UK as um, other countries do, which is crazy really because th- there's three teams, uh, well technically four, just from the UK who go to the ETC, and there's only one, maybe two a year around the ETC for team tournaments, which is which to me seems crazy. Yeah, team tournaments are not that common in, in, in Sweden either. Oh, right, okay. I think we have two each year. Yeah. Um, I host one of them. Um, so n- not that that common. Which do, is do a shame think, because... Do you think there's a reason for that? It's... Um, I don't know. Uh, people seem to enjoy them. Yeah playing at them you get a bit of a different crowd i think t- team tournaments they are less uh, beginners yeah so, no i agree so veterans only which is a big shame sometimes you have team team that bring uh, bring in uh, less experienced players from their club but you you never have com- p- people coming in that team noob are, are, yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> no, no team noob um and for people who have a hard time finding enough people to team up with, uh, it's uh, it's a real shame. Yeah. Um, mm. But hosting team tournaments is also quite easy, I think. It's um, you can even get away without having a ringer, uh, somewhat, uh, since you, if if you have uh, teams of say four people. You can arrange it so that if if they have an odd number of teams, the three bottom teams are mashed up instead in of just the one team versus another. So you have three teams um, pairing yeah. against each other, and you get um, what, twelve like, games out of that. You don't really have a choice. It's really hard to find a whole team of standing players. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's impossible. Yeah, um, there's no option. But that's also something to, to keep in mind. It's a lot easier to do that kind of things if you have an even number of players on each team, which is why I prefer uh, four-player teams instead of five. But when you hosted, you had three players, right? Didn't you? Uh, I, I've hosted once with three players and one once with four players. And oh, the, okay. the, the reason I went to four players is just that. The, oh, right. Just uh, easier. Yeah, easier with the with the odd number of teams. And I think both times I had to use... I had we had an odd, odd number of, of teams, mm. so something to keep in mind. No, it's good. All all little things like this are good for someone who is hopefully listening to this and thinking, I, I want to run an event, and it's things that you don't realize until it happens to you. Those little learning things. Yeah. Which which make quite a big difference for you running it and uh, the people taking part. Certainly. Um, so uh, on uh, on format, uh, I think we should mention scenarios as well. Mhm. Mm-hmm. So the ninth edge com- comes with uh, some fairly re- really good basic scenarios, I think from the rulebook and a lot of tournaments just run them straight out of the book and that's a very good game Um, but you can of course do something a bit more different Um, so I usually host two tournaments per year and one of those we're trying to get get a rhythm to it so one of those will be a team tournament and the other will be a singles tournament and on the singles tournament we are uh, generally, generally have quite a lot of weird scenarios. Um, 
so some general thoughts on doing that. It's obviously quite quite, quite a lot of work, um, depending on how you approach it, of course. But it's it's certainly more work, work than just pulling them straight out of the, <coughs> out of the core rules. Um, but generally, I found that people quite enjoy it. And uh, if you enjoy making it, then it's no reason not, not to do it, basically. And there, some of the more competitive players might not like it. Yeah. Um, I think you had a pretty good system for that last year. Where you did uh, the top tables played normal uh, scenarios. Yeah, that, that was a longer while ago um let's see here <laughs> uh, but yeah i um i, I think w one of the more common ways to, to do special special scenarios is to assign each round with a a scenario and that's the common way to do scenarios generally round one is is a frontline clash and hold the ground yeah maybe we should round two is something else so yes, uh, doing that yes the normal scenarios you can do the each round is connected to the combination of secondary objective and uh, deployment, or you could randomize. Like each player just roll a die on the on the on the table in the rulebook, uh, or you could do what we did last time in my tournament was randomize at the start of each each game. Yeah. Um, and yet for, for the whole for the whole round every game every game. Yeah. It was sort of an anti plan. So if you play five games, there are six scenarios in the rule book. If you're not using capture flag, then that will affect list building. Yeah, mm -hmm. then everybody just spams score units scoring units. That's yeah. very, very true. But it's so, a way to contract those effects. Yeah. That's that's good. Um, <clears throat> so another right, yeah. way of doing yeah, go ahead. Um, no, I was just gonna say that was a side um, side discussion, so we could go back to the original discussion about the the more crazy scenarios. Uh, I think we'll we'll approach approach it this way. Um, another way to to assign scenarios is to have every table has its own scenario. So when you when you come up to the table, you you check what it is, and that can be done with the with the standard scenarios as well. That's interesting, then it's, yeah. It's more, more random it's what you get. Uh, and, and you might end up playing the same scenario several times. Yeah, I suppose that, that's the only downside. If if you get someone on table one whose army is good on that scenario mission, mm. and they just camp out on table one all game <laughs> and could even get the same side. So uh, one way to, to sort of combat this is to not do the secondary objective table based, but the, the deployment. Ah, right, okay. Yeah, that could so be. You can feel the terrain. Yeah, isn't what type of deployment it is? I think that. Isn't the, the the map pack of the Ninth Age uh, intended to be used that way, pretty much? Pretty so much. So there are hmm. different uh, terrain setups for different scenarios. Uh, yeah. So you can can certainly do it that way. Um, in, in the UK, with the missions, what we do um, nine times out of ten is the player pack on the day when people walk through the door, register and get a pack. The missions and deployment types are in the pack, um, so you don't see it beforehand. Um, another way, um, which can cause a few issues, is um, the TO rolls for it at the start of each uh, round. Which mission and deployment? Just so it's random. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Um, I think those are the the ways you can use the standard scenarios. So, some more special scenarios, <clears throat> unique ones. So one method that I've used quite a lot a lot of times is this uh, setup with every every table having its own scenario, but instead of a standard one, they have a, a unique one. So that way you can't get the same one twice. And we also in, in the pairing have this, that uh, you, you can't play on the same table uh, more than once. 
Um, and then you can also really go wild with um, with the terrain and try and make scenarios that are very very much connected to the terrain. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I have one table with um, large portals in each end, and then you of course can, can jump between those portals. That's cool. Uh, <clears throat> so as as Eric mentioned. Um, Last time I ran, ran this kind of setup, since quite a lot of the, uh, quite a few of the, the more competitive players were a bit annoyed at uh, my crazy scenarios, I made it that the top five tables had just normal, not normal scenarios. Yeah. And I think the top, uh, the, the six to ten table had pretty simple but still unique scenarios, and then. After that, you know, on, on all the, the, the tables below it, I just went nuts with crazy <laughs> scenarios. Was free for all. Yeah, so 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 that was fun, really, um, and I think quite appreciated from from most of the players. <clears throat> I know one of the players though; he uh, is quite a good player, but he really enjoys crazy scenarios, and he did well the whole tournament. So he played on every single one of those top five tables. I didn't get to use any of our fun little no. scenarios. <laughs> so I felt really bad for him. <laughs> Poor Dennis. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, this kind of setup, it does require quite a lot, <coughs> quite a lot of work. Uh, yeah. I think I've, ha I've had something like 25 unique scenarios. Oh, wow. Uh, some, so that's... Yeah, you, you can get a bit crazy uh, doing all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think that's all I have to say about scenarios. Really, there are there are more more ways to do scenarios, of course, and unique scenarios than there are. Yeah, uh, I don't know, lingon berries in the world. You, 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 your imagination's the only limit, I suppose. Yeah. Like goes crazy as you want, or use the, the missions and deployments out of the rulebook. It it really is up to you. Yeah. Oh, I should also also mention that there is a a scenario booklet re, booklet released by uh, the Night Edge Project with a lot of of crazy scenarios. And yes, uh, yes, as it happens, I, I myself worked on that, so a lot of those scenarios have been at my tournament. So, if you are interested, you can check those out. Cool. Okay. So, I guess that's uh, format. Unless you have anything you want to add? Uh, no, go ahead. Format. What do you mean with that? Yeah, the, the, um, uh, the, the tournaments and all of that. Uh, single, so, singles and that. Yeah, or so, whether you have a, a campaign weekend, which might suit the more hobby hobbyists, um, and do linked games like you mentioned, Mad. Um, so you could have something on one table affecting another table, and vice versa. Yeah. So that may suit the, the less uh, competitive side. Everyone still likes winning, but um, instead of a game five, uh, you have a big game. So everyone versus everyone on one big table. Um, or even I want to look at running um, a UK hobby masters at the same time as the game masters, um, where one of the rounds you get points for speed painting a model. <laughs> uh, so Not just something, it. yeah, just something really cool, really different. Um, yeah. yeah, it bit goes crazy or as conservative as you want to be, I suppose. Yeah. I think these kind of narrative scenarios uh, or, or tournaments, I, I don't think I've ever seen one for uh, for Ninth Age, but I think they're fairly common in, in Age of Sigmar. Yeah, there's um, there's I, I think there's definitely a call for them. Um, yeah. But it, it it's just if if the if there's enough of the call, um, and if it won't put a lot of players off because at the end of the day it's, it's a lot of time and money to run events um 
and it'd be nice for a lot of people to go and enjoy it. Yeah, I, I think those can be quite difficult to to organise. Um, An appeal, I suppose, to the hardcore, well, hardcore tournament game side of it. Yeah, I think you would be able to find people interested generally. Yeah, You'd be surprised. I think <clears throat> at how many would l- w- want to go with something like that, um, but. I think getting it right can be very tricky. Um, but if you, if you, if if anybody wants to try, I uh, very much welcome it. Yeah, I might try it this year. I might try it. That sounds neat. <clears throat> so I think that uh, can segue a bit into uh, soft scores. Yeah. With painting and all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so soft scores is. Um, generally in a tournament you, you earn points for each game you play between 0, zero and 20 points and uh, if you play 5 games then you have a total of 100 points available and soft scores is what we call points awarded outside of that system basically mm-hmm. um, so it includes I think generally painting for the most part that's the most common, at least. Yeah. Yeah, painting, um, and then you've got sports as well. Can yep. come into it. Yeah. Um, I think those two are probably the the most seen, I suppose. Yeah. And related to painting, uh, at least in Sweden, we have some tournaments with uh, what you see is what you get. Um, yeah. Visivig ratings at uh, two. Um, so, um, some thoughts about how to apply these, uh, starting with painting perhaps. <clears throat> um, in Sweden, at least, I think the most common way is that the, the TOs go around and basically judge uh, the painting of, of the different armies and assign a, a point va- value between 0 and 20, most of, often. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, there are other ways to do it. Uh, yeah, in, in, in the UK we do something similar. Uh, not at all events, um, because I think we need more soft scores in the UK. Um, we're a little bit loose when it comes to painting requirements at some events um yeah. which I, I would love to see improved um i got actually told i, I should go to sweden because i'd love it there for the painting requirements <laughs> um which was quite funny um yeah so it could be three points um, from zero to three um, for basing so if it's just painted green it's zero but if you've got sand and a tuft, it could be two. If you've got something extra like um, snow or lava or water effects, then you get three. So it's yep. in like degrees of complexity. Painting exactly the same. Um, if it's got three hand edge highlights, you'll get the four points. If it's um, base coated, you might get one. And, st- and so it sort of adds up to about 20, I think, overall. Yeah, sounds very similar uh, too. Sorry, I, I dropped out for a bit. What are we talking about? Uh, painting scores. Yeah, soft scores on painting. Um, and just how to, I think applying them is quite tough because... It's so time-consuming. Time yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know about you, I think there's, because it's quite a close-knit community, you don't kind of want to annoy or offend someone. Yeah, when you're mm-hmm. applying them, so sometimes it can be a bit awkward, especially if you're good friends with someone. Yeah, that's that can definitely be an issue. Um, but they they know the rules. They've seen the pack in advance. They know what should be expected. So I suppose you you have to stand by it at the end of the day. What's in the pack? Yeah, but that, if you have a pack, like if if you have clear guidelines yeah. then it's sort of okay but sometimes you don't have that you just 
people are just doing subjective yeah thing like on a subjective scale of zero to ten how beautiful do i think this armor is yeah, yeah. that's more tricky oh so like how, how do you gentlemen feel about um concept armies so what do you mean? um so um let's say you've got a, a vermin swarm army it's been very very lightly dry brushed with dark greys uh, over the edges and then wherever there's warp stone or something that shines um that's been mm-hmm. painted a spot color yeah so it looks like it's underground so like it, it could be a very dark gray black army but then certain bits of bright green for instance don't think I've ever seen that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have. I think we have at least one. Not so uncommon with the Vampire Covenant. Yeah, doing ghosts. Yeah. Uh, ghost uh, scenes and stuff like that. Yeah. I think it looks yeah. okay. Yeah, as, as long as it, it makes sense, I, I'm totally fine with it. Cool. Uh, it's just the argument of have they done it because I wanted to look cool or have they done it because it's dry brushing yeah. and picking out a few bits in a different colour for speed, I yeah. suppose, is is the issue some people have. Um, my general approach to, to painting scores is, well, the, the, the purpose of it is, of course, mm. to in, encourage people to, to bring painted armies, basically. Sure. We, we want to have nice armies on the table. That's uh, everybody, everybody gets happy from that, too. Yeah, totally. And... Uh, um, so you you want to encourage people to to put some effort in and, and get get their armies painted basically, mm-hmm. and what you have to separate that from is people who who are not great painters basically. Uh, yeah. You don't, you don't want to punish people who have, have really tried their best and it just didn't come out that that good. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that's where you've got to draw the line of someone putting in effort and someone just trying to. Um, get round having to put effort in yeah uh, and that's where really the, the problem comes when writing trying to write coherent rules about how you how the army should look yeah because it's it's difficult to catch that and it's it's their hobby at the end of the day like it's up to them what they do with yeah. painting an army um, for some people it, it's painting it's, it's it's just not that important yeah yeah and um that everyone has different ways to enjoy it, and uh, so yeah. If if, if you want to, if you're there to, there to to just play games, um, like, then that's your choice. But it's uh, edge highlighting 120 models isn't high on your list of uh, yeah things to do. But, uh, but bring bring a a painted army, even though it perhaps doesn't enhance your play experience, it might enhance the opponent's 100%. It's, play it's, experience. Th- there's two people at a table, not just yeah. one. So, that's important to keep in mind. Um, my approach the last couple of, of years that I've hosted has been that I, I've judged the army uh, at an uh, a model level. I look at the, the the worst painted model in the army, basically, and mm-hmm. assign points. I think between one and seven for that, and then look at the army as a whole. If it looks co- coherent, like a single single army, and points for that, I think between zero and eight, um, and then points for uh, for Visivig uh, up to so that the, the total is is up to twenty. Yeah. And one thing to note about this is that when I judge the army level, I ignore all unpainted models. Generally, you want to have painted models on the, on the table. And if you have any unpainted model in the army, you, of course, get zero on the, uh, on the uh, model level, on the in individual model level. Mm-hmm. But you, I want to encourage people to try and, and get themselves new armies. So, uh, and if they can can play with a, a half finished army and not suffer super much, I think that's good. So try and find a good balance between what's fair. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and if, if 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 it's someone who's who's working on on painting their army up, mm-hmm. uh, I don't want to pay, punish them them too much because they are still putting it, the effort in. Um, 
at something like mm-hmm. so i have quite a bit different approach to this yeah i think it's it, it's better to sort of encourage these sort of people to like do the base paint on all models spray them do like three four five colors just dry brush something so it looks okay-ish cohesive and you can get full points like spend three hours <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that works for some people, but for for me, uh, I some people just just wouldn't. They, they want to to take the time for, of every model, but they, they, there's just not enough time to finish it in time of terms. Yeah, sure maybe, about. but most people like that would also not bring an unpainted model to a tournament. <laughs> maybe. Um, I've, but there's been times when. I've been working on an army for a tournament and um, instead of taking it uh, just to try and win a best painted award, um, I've taken an old army, which is fully painted, um, just so I wouldn't get hit by any painting uh, points deductions. Um, So I've had to wait and not put bare plastic or even just an undercoated model on. Um, Whether that's out of respect to the opponent or just because I'm quite funny about my hobby. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I like to see fully painted armies across the board because I think it makes the game better mm, or the experience yeah. better, I suppose. Because at the yeah. end of the day, the, you, if you're running an event or going to an event, um, you've paid money to expect a certain level of standard um, at that event, possibly. Um, like if I was to go to an event and I played five people with um, just undercoated models and mine was fully painted, based, light effects, fireworks went off when I moved a model, um, I'd, I'd be annoyed, I think. Like why, why have I paid all this money and they haven't like been bothered to yeah. get it done? Yeah. So yeah, it's ju- just just a viewpoint. Just a viewpoint. Yeah, it's um, it's a tr- tricky thing. Um, one more thing about painting that I wanted to bring up. I know that uh, Quest for Atlantis did this one year. I don't know if you hosted it that that year, Eric, but you let mm-hmm. the players do the the uh, judging. So in, in yeah. each game, they the player yeah, we... the, the opponent submit, submitted a score of the opponent's army. Yeah, we tested that once. It was, mm, there's a reason we didn't do it again. <laughs> All right. Yeah. right the, the benefit, I, I, I suppose, is that uh, you don't have to walk around the venue and talk, talk to every uh, every person or ju- judge every army as a, as a TO. Yeah, I mean, yeah for, for, for an organizer, it's pretty nice because you don't have to do anything. You just provide every player with a, like a sheet, scoring sheet. Is everything painted? Yes, no. Is everything based? Yes, no. How many? I mean, there's a lot. It was something like 15 maybe different things to grade the opponent in. Yeah. And we did that for, you did that, I think, in four or five games. I don't think we did it in the last game. Uh, and we took the average, something like that. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, over in Europe, um, when it comes to like painting awards, do. do um, the tournament organizer judge uh, the best painted, or do you get the people at the tournament, the players, to judge it? Um, Pretty much both. always players. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the UK, sometimes it's the TO, sometimes it's the players. Um, what I do, I try to, I, I run two. I'm quite, quite lucky. I know um, a former heavy metal painter who lives quite local. Um, and he comes and does like the really, really fancy one, and then I have a players one as well. So um, you get two winners, which is quite nice. Yeah. yeah. People's choice and uh, and uh, the real deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it, there's a bit more um, onus, or I, I don't know what you call it, like a bit more um, prestige, because and former heavy metal painters painted it who's won golden demons uh judged it sorry which is pretty cool 
Mm, yeah, that's pretty cool. <clears throat> Suddenly. Yeah. So I don't know any heavy metal or golden demon winners. I don't <laughs> think I can do that. Find them. They're everywhere. Find them. <laughs> Uh, maybe some of the Primo guys? I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah. They're good at painting, at least. <laughs> um, so, uh, did you get to the, the downside of the... of the... Uh, yeah, so... The uh, main downside is probably that people judge. It's a subjective thing, and... Mm-hmm people are different it's pretty much the same problem with sportsmanship i think it yeah. can but then um, you also have often at least you have players you can annoy people, people. Um, yeah and you don't want to pee anyone off because it is so subjective the hobby which yeah. is also the strength of it but it's also can be um a downside i suppose at the end of the day if someone doesn't get your painting style or theme yeah, with the, we, I think the the biggest problem was that people who don't care about painting themselves, they didn't yeah. bother to score the opponent, so they just put everything is fine. Check, check, check. I'm done. Yeah. Um, I I throw an additional tournament point out um, for people who vote for best painted. Yeah. Um, just That's to get people thing. to actually take part, because like you said, people who don't care, they just turn up to get the twenty nils. Um, might not be bothered to vote. So mm -hmm. it gives them an incentive to actually vote and take part and actually look yeah. and try and get interested in that side of the hobby. Yeah, the main drawback is that you have to actually check who, who voted and who didn't. <laughs> yeah, again, more, more work for the, the TO. Yeah. So, but generally, I agree that it's a, it's a good approach to, to encourage vo voting that way. Um, yeah, I agree. So, yeah, we'll move move on to sports then. Uh, so I think there's there's two parts of this. One part is the, the soft score, and the other is uh, is um, a an award for for best sportsman, and they are often related. Yeah, we we don't in the UK have a soft score for sportsmanship points. Um, just because it can get a bit messy and people voting for their friends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what we do, yeah, um, game five, um, it is uncommon in the UK, but it just limits um, any anything what could happen. So halfway through game five, um, we hand out a little slip and just say, oh, um, at the end, could you just vote for your best uh, opponent over the weekend? And then... Um, if I get five minutes or I get a minion to go round and get their uh, sports votes, that helps out. Yeah. I've seen that um, that method uh, quite often. I think one downside is that uh, if you're asked to vote in, in game five or after game five, five even, even, you have uh, the game five and game game four much more fresh in memory so you're more likely to vote for them i think yeah um, when you go to such a tournament you have to keep in mind that you, you you're voting in the in the end so if you have a really good experience you need to note that make a mental note of that basically yeah totally i'd like to think people as well do have a think about it um and it's not just oh i'll just vote for you there you go. Good game five. Thank you. Yeah. And they actually put some thought into it. That, that's the hope, at least. Yeah. But sport, sports is something that's really tricky, in my opinion. I've, I've hosted a lot of tournaments, as I said, and I generally consider my tournament to be be a place where, where people are uh, sportsmen-like. But we never actually had yeah. any scores for it, which is something that's Annoying me a bit, but because I don't really know how to do it. In a good no, way. I, I think a so lot of other do. systems have a lot of issues as well with 
um, people being overly nice to their opponents, saying, oh, I'll vote for you for best sports, and then kind of getting them to vote for them as mm-hmm. well, if if it can adversely affect the final standings. Yeah. Um, so I think to that end, it's just easier to have an overall um, favourite game instead of doing it on from zero to five or zero to ten for each game. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. having it affect soft scores yeah. can co- combat the, the issue of people mm-hmm. just being voting friend- friendly, basically. Ta- tactical, uh, tactical voting. Yeah. But at the same time, if you don't have have it soft scores, there's no motivator for the, the those who are not likely to win it. Basically. Yeah, certainly. So yeah, it's a it's a tricky one. Tough one. Yeah. Uh, so I guess what we're saying is, uh, if you uh, listeners out there have any better suggestions, we'd like to hear it. Oh, please, <laughs> please. <laughs> we are we are all open to ideas. Uh, so, is that all of the soft, soft scores? Um, I think yeah. I, uh, in I have... Quest for Atlantis, we used to do a quiz yeah. a couple of years ago. We don't do it anymore, but my impression was that people liked it. Yeah. We did something like 10 questions, rules related questions, and five uh, background fluff related questions, and then just uh, like one x2 type of questions you fill it in left it to us we scored it and then you get it added to your uh, final standings yeah uh, but it's uh, quite a lot of work to write this uh, oh yeah it's, it was sort of with uh one of maybe we will reintroduce it now but like earlier ninth age editions where the rules changed Every three months, it was <laughs> two weeks. Pretty mean to ask rules questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the the fluff was also sort of undeveloped early ninth age, so yeah, it's hard I, to keep up. I, I've done this once uh, at my tournament. Had a quiz in in ninth age, mm-hmm. and yeah. that was the basic thinking was that that there are there are three aspects to the hobby. There's the game. There's the painting and there's the background, and I wanted to to do something for for everyone basically. But mostly, I wanted to to open people's eyes about there being background material for the Night Age. This was, yeah, I think it was shortly before the uh, Wars of the Dark Gods book was released. So you had the main rule book basically, and that's about it. And uh, a lot of people hadn't even noticed that Night Age had background. I think that Warriors book was um, a big turning point for yep. Ninth Age for background and the depth that the project is about. So it was really cool to see that. Yeah. Um, when I did the quiz, basically uh, some a few people bothered to to open books and and, and study a little bit basically <laughs> um, to to try and get. Uh, a little bit of an advantage, and, and I know some people uh, came up came up to me afterwards and said thank you for for doing this. I I, I, I quite enjoyed reading the fluff, and they hadn't noticed it before. That's cool. Um, but it, the idea also kind of backfired because um, I had one award for for best general, well, best painter, and best um, uh, quiz master, and then uh, a, a top overall. And the idea was, was to get a few different peoples in the, these different categories. Mm-hmm. But the best player in in uh, in Sweden at that time, uh, Östling, he's he's such a uh, a gamer and, uh, that he, he has couldn't stand the thought of, of not winning. So he, he <laughs> super studied all the background and got uh, uh, everything right wow. in, the, in the quiz. And uh, I think that was around 20 points. And most other people got like five. <laughs> so he won the tournament, he won the best general and the overall. <laughs> wow. So but it was a fun experience. So um with that out out of the way, um I thought we could talk a little bit about tables and terrain. Yeah. Um 
I see what uh, that we've been going on for quite a while, so maybe we should <clears throat> do it a bit quicker. So for tables, yeah. I think I have one th thing to say, really. Um, generally, you have these large boards uh, that are uh, 120 centimeters or uh, times uh, 180 or uh, 72 inch times 48, I guess, is the preferred measurement. Mm -hmm. And those can be quite un unwieldy. And two is that there's something called a Gorilla Gripper, which is just a, a handle that you put on it, on, on, the, on the board, and you can carry it around really easily. So that I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just from the UK's perspective, with all the gaming centres, the tables are there already, so it is... <laughs> It is. I oh, know. I'm sorry. Oh, that's I'm sorry. Uh, the tables are there already. Um, and the nice thing is, a lot of the tables, well, 99% of them, um, we call them six, six by fours, six by fours. Um, they, uh, they have like battle mats on. So, like um, thin, yeah. is it neoprene? Um, just rolled out just to add it. So, it's not just a sprayed green or a bare. Uh, yeah. wood color so it just it, it adds a little bit of um yeah. immersion so but yeah most th tournaments in sweden are, are starting to use those those gaming mats all, almost exclusively yeah they are good um so That's from a uk really perspective nice. yeah the ta sorry guys but the, the tables are already at the venue <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yeah. so terrain um for those who, uh, who don't host tournaments at, uh, <laughs> yeah. at uh, gaming clubs where all of that is already set, um, I think I'd like to mention 2D terrain. Uh, as a yeah, very what's easy your problem, though? What did you say? Uh, it's quite... Uh, oh, well. 2D Do terrain is more a... Hate them? It's a yeah, exactly. I, I think top tables, yes. Bottom tables, no, because the top table players <laughs> um, don't or might not. It may be, I may be mistaken. Don't care about the immersion or the look of the table. Mm -hmm. They just need to know what things are. <laughs> yeah, um, and it's it's not a bad thing. Like it, it, it is how it is. But I would rather play with an amazing six by four table with really cool scenery and it looks pretty with pretty armies, but if it comes down to a few millimeters or a few centimeters or inches um or even a fraction of an inch that could cost a game i can see why 2d terrain is superior yeah mm -hmm. generally I, I think there are very few people who actually prefer to play on 2d terrain um maybe some of the top players but even there i don't think it's very popular mm. not from my, from my experience I can see it why is. it's used, but I'd rather not, personally. Yeah, I, th I think it, the main main uh, appeal of it is the simplicity of, of, of transport. And oh, yeah, you can just throw it in a, mm -hmm. a small box and you've got enough for all your tables. Yeah. So if you are if you have a problem with space and, and storing and, and all of that, it's certainly an option. But uh, some people will not like it, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, one other thing that I want to mention about tournament, uh, about uh, terrain, is that I, I've heard, heard stories about uh, ter tournaments where the player bring the terrain. So you bring, I think, uh, three or four pieces each player, and then you bring those with you to every ta table you play at, and then you set up uh, the, the terrain together with the opponents and his pieces. And then you play at that game, and then you take your train and move on to the next table. Um, that used to be a thing in Warhammer 8th edition for a lot of tournaments at the UK, um, where in the pack um, you'd be asked to bring one or two pieces of terrain. It could it could be anything. Um, but in 9th, I haven't seen it as much, or if at all, just because there may be some very um, tall buildings or 
funny shaped um, woods which may benefit someone's army, for instance. Um, but in Ninth, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, yeah I, have, I have never seen it. Um, I think it's an interesting co concept and certainly easy for the TO. Um, but I think it can lead to some pretty strange situations. Yeah, um, if if you have a, a model which doesn't need line of sight and you can just put it behind a, <laughs> a, a piece of terrain you've brought specifically, um, where it would take about four turns for anything to get to that model, um, I, I think it could have a negative effect. Yeah. Takes mod modeling to an advantage to a whole new, new yeah. level. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Um, I, I I think we could talk endlessly about making terrain. Um, so I don't think we'll go go into that. There are many different ways, basically, many different levels you can can make terrain at. Mm. Quick and easy, yeah, or it's... super detailed. Um, but uh, that's that's a topic for an, another show, basically. Uh, so I would say if you're starting like to run events and it's your first event and you don't have access to um, a local gaming store or anything like that, maybe for the first event, whilst you're building it up, 2D terrain might be the best option. Yeah. Because yeah. there's lots of companies out there where they could offer you bundles or just say you're running an event and would they like to sponsor it a little bit and you may get discounts so i can see for, for for a person who may need to sort out boards and terrain 2d could be the way forward to that first one might be yeah. an idea yeah i remember my first tournament uh, me and my co-host we we built what was it 40 hills and <laughs> 40 forests and uh, yeah yes nuts uh, how much terrain we, we pumped out in for that first tournament. Yeah. Really low quality, really cheap stuff. <laughs> but uh, we made a lot of it, at least. Yeah. <laughs> Big brushes. <laughs> um, so, a little bit about logistics behind hosting a tournament. Again, I think it's just mostly an issue for those who don't have game stores. Sorry. Um, so, um, but even schools can have uh, options for this. I know that uh, the tournaments in in uh, Västerås in Sweden are really spoiled because the schools allow them to uh, to store all the, the tables and all of that in the in the basement. Oh wow! Yeah. So they, it just sits there uh, all year round until they, they 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 host the tournament and they bring it out. That's really good. Yeah. Yeah. All the train, all the tables. So that's neat. So ask your your venue if that's an option. Yeah. I've asked many times. It's not it's not an option for, for me. I'm so sad. <laughs> uh, otherwise, um, I, I think with logistics as well, it's nothing will ever run to the time you think it will. Getting to some, for, for some places, something could happen. So always <laughs> allow yourself, especially in the few days before, um, just an extra half an hour or an hour to the day, just in case you do need it, um, to get stuff set up, get boards ready, transport them, get scenery, because if scenery breaks, you, you may have to fix that. Um, or the car might not start. So um, always allow a little bit longer, just in case. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly good advice. Um, okay. Um, trailers. Do you have any thoughts about that to get stuff around? Um, I know we usually uh, rent a. A, a cart or a trailer. I'm not sure exactly sure on the on the English term. Yeah, yeah, like um, uh, just what you pop on the back. Um, yeah, trailer. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Get a roof on it. Yeah. It might 
start raining <laughs> in that area. That's not good. Yeah, something with a roof. Uh, and get a big one. There's nothing worse than not fitting everything and you have to go two runs. Yeah, preferably uh, rather too too large than too small for sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, so, that's good. Um, okay, pairings. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is mostly a dis discussion about what kind of software is out there to do pairings. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are quite a lot of options, really. Yeah. So um, the UK now solely uses Tournament Keeper. Well, Tony Keeper, sorry. Yeah. Um, it's just much easier and less um, something worse, like something bad could happen if you're like making your own Excel spreadsheet. Um, I'm terrible at Excel and it scares me, even though I use it at work every day. Um, <laughs> and it just takes takes the burden away from you because you can get the the people going to the event, the players to enter in their scores. It's all there. Everyone can see what's going on. You can amend it if needs be. And it's saving you time, which is really important. Yeah. Yeah, those are really nice where the, the, the players themselves just fill in. Yeah, online. and it, it just it cuts down so you don't need to count through result slips, um, mm -hmm. make sure they're all right. The players can see themselves after they've agreed the result. If needs be, you can alter it. But if something's saving you time and effort, then... 100% do it if you're looking to run an event like it it'll just make the day easier and it even works out the standings and then the next round so it's win-win yeah 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 there are good good options in this uh, age mm. of, of information yeah technology um i use my own, my own prog program oh, uh, brave. yeah it's uh, it's struggled a few times, mm -hmm. uh, really, really nervous, but I, I know it fairly well, so I can, yeah. can work it around it. Um, yeah, uh, I, most tournaments. Is is it the tourney keeper we used to? No, we actually there's a Swedish version of that. Okay. Uh, Exxon, Exxon, it's called, which is, I mean, it is a Swedish guy who just hosts it on yeah. his own server. But it's pretty much the same thing. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. I tried to do, or, or like, well, the first tournament I did, I, I, I broke my own um, pairing program, just sort of like a, a coding challenge to myself. Yeah, that's how I started too. Yeah, but it's, it's so buggy and you have to maintain <laughs> it. And oh, it's, <laughs> my life is yeah. so much easier now that I just use this online. Yeah, someone else did it. Someone else will yeah. fix the bugs. It's nice. Mm -hmm. But then you can't do all the the, yeah. the features. Like, yeah, I think um, the version we used they didn't have um, support for uh, like painting scores and soft scores. Yeah. You might have to do some things yourself. But that's that usually not a big hassle. So, um, good to, to, to keep in mind what kind of options there are in the in the software for different kinds of soft, soft scores. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah um it's whatever's easiest for you at the end of the day um yeah and there are like you guys have said there are programs um systems out there which just make it easier which is always good yeah. and it's just down to what you want to use at the event there's no right or wrong it just what works for you yeah, certainly. And it's it's a good idea to look around a little bit to find mm -hmm. some options. Yeah. Um, I think we can also also mention uh, the Ringer 
in this regard. If you have a, an odd, odd number of player players, you need someone to step up. Yes. Um, and that's just something that's that, that's good to have, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I know some people play the role of the ringer themselves while they're, they're hosting. I did that for my first event. That was the worst mistake I ever made. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had uh, similar experiences. Yeah. If there is less than 10 people, you can do it. But more than 10, try to not do it. Yeah, my first event, I think it was 30 people. Mm. Um, that was a, a learning a learning experience that was being a ringer as well as running it yeah I can imagine yeah so get yourself a ringer that's uh, basically do you, do you <laughs> guys offer the ringer anything um, in the UK we normally it's obviously free entry um, and like free lunch and meals on the day yeah and, a few, like and a few pints of beer um, like that yeah like yeah. free entry, free food, and whatever else we can offer. Free yeah. Snacks. Yeah. Um, and it's also yeah. good because if I don't need to play, you can use them as a minion. Um, mm -hmm. Just to sort things out so it's not too bad. Yeah. Did, uh, I did think. Someone heard that maybe he, he needs to play one game or the two games on the Sunday. Yeah. Or if yeah, someone drops like, out overnight or someone's yeah. not feeling well or yeah. for any yeah. reason. That's that's very important. If yep. uh, even if it looks like you're an even number of player players, anything uh, can, can happen. Get get yourself a ringer. You always might need one. The, there was one event where everything was okay, and um, one of the guys in early ninth, his wife went into early labour, um, <laughs> so I had to drive. I think it was a hundred and twenty miles home very quickly. Um, yeah. So a anything. To the people listening thinking about running an event anything can happen like anything um so yeah just a ring is a very very good idea definitely mad yeah okay um i thought it was something more i wanted to say about ringers but uh it slipped my mind. Keep them happy. <laughs> Keep them happy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now it, uh, I rem remembered. You mentioned uh, uh, a few beers. Uh, yeah. Just something that I, that I want to point out. Since most tournaments in Sweden are hosted in schools, there's a strict no alcohol policy. Ah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, so to me, it's uh, I don't drink alcohol at all. Uh, yeah. So to, to me, it's very foreign this uh, combi combining of finishing uh, <laughs> uh, games and and alcohol. Uh, I know um, that it's quite common that people people go out and drink. In the, yeah, we we, in we have a um a Saturday social where people go for food and drink. Uh, mm -hmm. I I don't drink as much as I used to. I drink very rarely now. Um, but for a lot of people, it's um. It's a weekend away with the boys, away from the wife or kids or real life. Um, so a lot of uh, venues have got their own bar um, and they do table service. So you could be rolling dice and um, a very nice person will bring over a few bottles of beer for you. Um, and touch wood, um, we've never had any problems with anyone being too drunk or being angry or anything. Because everyone's there, like having fun and in, in good spirits. Mm. I don't think I've ever seen that at a ninth age tournament tournament in Sweden. But before that, I've heard that there there's been some some incidents. Oh dear. <laughs> but nothing nothing too bad. Yeah. Oh. I think the, the 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 worst we've had is that people drop out. On the second day, because they got too we, we we've had that. We've had people too hungover, yeah, um, to get out of bed. Um, <laughs> so ringers are good in that instance. Yes. Um, so it's quite good uh, yeah. for that. But yeah, yeah, I'd forgotten we had a few people drop out for uh, heavy heavy nights, heavy nights. Okay, so uh, awards. 
one of the last topics. Um, so I mentioned it briefly that we have uh, in Sweden we uh, often have um, best overall prices and then sometimes prices for best painted or best general or some, something like that. But depending on the, the amount of soft scores, it might not might not be necessary to separate the best overall from the best, yeah, best, best general. general. To clarify, best general typically means most battle points, so without soft yeah. score. Excellent. So if, if you don't have a lot of soft scores, that's usually the same as the, uh, the best overall. Often, even if you have a lot of soft score, it's the same person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I think is a bit sad. You want, you want to, as an organizer, you want to give away prizes to as many different people as possible. Oh, totally. So, yeah. But yeah. you also don't want your the player who got the most battle points. He should get some prize, probably. Yeah. Uh, so if you have a lot of soft score, it might be motivated to still have a, a best yes. general prize. Yeah. I know the the the, the Gates of Westridge uh, did once a tournament with a hundred points uh, from uh, battle points, a hundred points painting, and a hundred points uh, sports. I think. Yep. So that was uh, interesting to say the least. Uh, uh, oh, one of the um, soft scores as well. Uh, um, yeah. um, event in Ireland um, a few months ago was fancy dress. And the person who actually won the event won it due to their fancy dress over someone who didn't dress up. <laughs> uh, and I think it came down to one point as well. Um, so Cor wasn't happy flying all the way over to lose it because he didn't dress up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh... So, what kind of awards uh, do do you have, basically? Uh, what do the winner get? Winner get? Um, I use a company at the moment called um, Dark Fantastic Mills, who do three D printed um, awards, um, and they do it in small, medium, or large. Um, and at my most recent event, they can actually plan in. So, on the plinth at the bottom, on the base, um, you can have your tournament name. Um, and then like first place or whatever you want to put it. And it's actually in the shape of a giant Warhammer from Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Nice. Um, so, so I have those. Um, Should be a big, big uh, sword now. Maybe. Yeah, you, you know what? You can, you, they do actually do a sword with um, like a skull on the hilt, um, which is really cool. Um, they are pricey, but they're very good. And I think people appreciate that. Um, uh, what else? A lot of uh, venues they also do um, uh, gift prizes, so you've got a store credit yep. for use mm. in the store, which is always quite nice um, for lots of things. So first place might get um, a fifty euro store credit, second thirty, third place like fifteen euros or something like that. Um, I also go to a lot of sponsors before an event. I think that's a big thing as well. Um, do you guys uh, use or buy or know of Green Stuff World? Mm-hmm. I use a few um, other, other products. Yep. I, I, I've just emailed Israel, who, who runs it, um, for an event I'm actually running, uh, but for Lord of Rings in a few months. Um, and sponsorship's always good, because with the painting ones especially, um I, I weighed it up at my last event would someone appreciate a trophy or would they appreciate like 60 euros worth of hobby if they're yeah. if they're into the painting and modeling side of it more um so i think if if you if you're sensible sensible about it and let people know then it's all good but everyone likes quite a big trophy at the end of the day because it's cool even though it's quite lame but it's still cool <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's a memory to bring home. Yeah, and the wife to put it in a cupboard or somewhere under the stairs, <laughs> so it's not on display. <laughs> oh. 
Yeah, I'd like to mention uh, Shield Wolf Miniatures too. Uh, I know they, they have on their yeah. site um, kits that you can order with um, uh, with a large discount meant for tournaments, uh, tournament or mm-hmm. awards. So you get a, get a few. Very go- good. Can can you get uh, three different sizes and you get a few a few boxes and a few heroes and, and such like that. And I think I. I I haven't noticed it before, but I think next time I run a tournament, I'm, I might, might want to do that. And just hand out. Yeah, them. definitely. It's it, it's more free stuff, but it means a lot to people. Yeah. And I wor- worry a little bit about, I mean, you, you say you, you, you get that kit and you get a box of dwarves and some uh, some orc characters. And then the, the, the winner of the painting used something entirely different, elves. Of some sort, uh, it might feel a bit inappropriate to give them, the, give them dwarves, but I still think that most people are, are are just happy to get miniatures, and then maybe they can start a new army or something. Yeah, like I think, especially on the hobby side of prizes, if it is uh, um, random miniatures, it might spark. Or then you never know; they may have wanted to do that army for a while, and um, a few a unit or a model might kickstart it, which is cool. Yeah. Or they might have a friend who's exactly who's to who, start. who wants to get into the hobby, so it's win-win. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's always uh, appreciated, I think. Yeah, model that I have won has certainly been used as a Kickstarter for some of my projects. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. So it, it works. It really does, yeah. Because people like free stuff as well. <laughs> yep. Uh, Okay, so do we have anything more we want to say about awards? I think we've exhausted um, it. I, I've started running super quickly. Um, a oh, what do you call it? A uh, a raffle. So um, oh, I I get a um a, an army um through whatever means, whether eBay or models have already got, and I paint it up. Um, and I raffle it at the event. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, uh, I think like ninety-five percent of that goes to a charity. Um, if I've needed to buy glue or clippers, I've just got it back. But it's only a few, pe- uh, a few euros. Um, but yeah, we raffle it off. Um, and people seem interested in what I do, which is quite cool. I think whoever wins the raffle army um, also gets a free ticket to my next event. That's neat. Mm. Um, <laughs> only if they take that army, though. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there is there is a stipulation there, but it seemed popular a couple of weeks ago, so I may do it again. Yeah, that sounds neat. Yeah, it's just it, it think outside the box. Like it may work, it may not, but unless you try it, you won't know. Yep, certainly. Um, so the last item I have on my list is atmosphere. I guess how to get a good atmosphere at a tournament, what the, what the ter- tournament organizers can do about that. I mean, most tournaments sort of just naturally has a very nice, friendly atmosphere. Um, that something I think is important for people who have never been to a tournament to understand is that tournaments are not like super competitive people who just do whatever it takes to win. Like, there are those people, but not, not far from yeah, everyone. But, uh, mm, yeah, few, far between. Yeah, very, P- very people few. go to have fun, roll dice, and push yeah. toy so- plastic toy soldiers around on a table. Yeah, um, you can't take yourself too seriously doing that. Hopefully, no, <laughs> <laughs> no use in that. So, a lot of people I talk to try to convince people to get to tournaments. It's a lot of them are afraid of, of sort of the the competitive side of the of the hobby, especially for new players as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but that's not really the the truth of it. Like, 
Yeah, I think that's that's right. I think most people who have actually then went to a tournament, they 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 don't like, they come to the next tournament as well. And it's the one quite after addictive, that. isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I think definitely tournament gaming is an addictive experience, um, and I think that's what makes people go, especially if you've had a good time. Um, I walk around a lot when I get chance, sit, talk to people quickly, take photos, put them on Twitter. Um, and just make sure everyone's having a good time. And if they're not, why not? And if I can control that and help it, I will. Um, but a lot of tournaments um, in the UK, especially, they run themselves pretty much now. Like people know what's going to happen, what's going to do. Um, just be there, be smiley, be happy. And just if someone's got a problem, listen to them and try and solve it. Um, that's certainly true. Uh, all right. Um, do you want to finish on, on on the on the question of uh, why host tournaments? Yeah, because here we are. <sighs> <laughs> Mm. I mean, it, it, it's a lot of work host, hosting a tournament. People don't realize as well until they've actually run a tournament. I think it's a big thing. Yeah. But it's how it, much it, effort goes into it. It's rewarding as well, like at oh, the yeah. actual and seeing all those people who are there, who are playing because you took the effort, you, you organized it. People are having fun because of it's what because of something you did is a very cool feeling. Yeah. Like it's you, a, you get enjoyment uh, from seeing people enjoy themselves. Certainly. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's also partly um, that I want, I mean, I go to a lot of tournaments and I want to give back to the yeah. community, like uh, draw, do my share of the tournament hosting. Yeah. That's um, pretty much where I started. We're not the biggest system in the world, and if we can help out some way and make it grow, then that's a very positive thing, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, some people as well, if it's a first ever tournament, um, offer a slight discount as well. Um, just thinking about it, I haven't seen it much in the UK, but I, I am aware that that is a thing some places. Mm-hmm. I, I haven't heard of it. That could be a good idea. Even if it's a few euros just um, to incentivize a new person. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. that's what it's about at the end of the day. We're trying to grow the system and hobby um, without being a company. So any way we can do that, I, th- I think we should. Yeah. Okay. Hosting tournaments is probably one of the best ways of doing that. Totally. Oh, and also, something will go wrong at every event, but don't panic when it does. <laughs> um, you can plan as much as you, you want or you think you have, but something will go wrong, whether the food turns up late, there's a power cut, um, someone doesn't turn up, something will happen, and it's just about embracing the chaos i suppose <laughs> yeah that's very true okay so do you, are we gonna wrap it up at that yeah yeah sounds good yeah we, we've been going on for quite a while um so some um final thoughts on uh, your the painting that you've been doing while working, uh, or while, while recording, uh, Jordan? Um, I've done, uh, what's that, 12 models, cleaned up, glued, and filled as well. Um, so they're all ready to be glued onto bases and undercoated. Um, I've got a few more hours before I hit, head to bed, so I'll probably get another 20 done. Nice. Um, so that's one unit done, which isn't too bad for an evening's work. No, certainly not. Because no one likes mod lines. No one. 
That's very true. Eric? Yeah, um, made it maybe 75% through painting of this model. Um, but it, it's a character, so I'm putting quite a bit of time on him. And he was yeah. painted a bit before, and like the, the base coat was done. <clears throat> Uh, I'm not so used to painting and discussing at the same time, so I'm, I'm trailing a bit with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's something to get to get used to. Yeah, um, this is my uh, second two-hour podcast of the day, so uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, it's that's uh, rough. Yeah, it's next, on, le- next on, level. On yeah, we just finished uh, the new Thundercox podcast, so that was a okay, long so- one. So then the race is on to see who who posts it up. It's going to be uh, it's first. it's going to be yours. Uh, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> Jack's good, but sometimes, uh, yeah, he, he he might not get it done for a few days. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's uh, I usually do do the editing in the weekend. Uh, yeah. Now it's just the end of uh, end of the weekend, so we'll see when I get it done. But uh, hopefully pretty soon. Definitely. Um, so for m- myself, painting-wise, um, haven't made that much progress. I've hi- highlighted the, the skin of the orcs and the red armor, um, and started on the on the brown clothes, basically. Um, but uh, still a long way to go. It's been progress, ages. Though. Yeah, it's progress, and it's been ages since I last painted orcs. So it's Oof. nice to do it again. Yeah. So. Okay, I think that is all. Um, I thank everyone for watching, those who have made it this far. Uh, and I thank you too very much for, for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Well, thanks for having me. It's been very fun. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I guess that's it. Uh, so see you on the next next one. Cheers. Yep. See ya. See ya.